Ladies and gentlemen, the Beekman Boys. And then I want to, I want to intro, I want to do a little segue to you guys. Okay, good. So here's why they're here. Come close, come close. Let's pretend like we like each other. We're afraid of the microphone going off. No, of course, right, of course. So at our very first Bigger Game Expo, which some of you are louder, sorry, oh gosh. Okay, good. At our very first Bigger Game Expo two years ago, which will not happen ever again. There'll never be two years between them any longer. Yeah. Chuck and I decided last night, the next one's next weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so the very first one, um, there's a dear friend of mine, uh, Gar Garth and Doug, friends of ours, that moved to Sharon Springs, New York, a very poor area of lower state, sort of eastern, no, western part of New York State. And these guys moved in, they actually drove through and there was this old, old hotel. The name of that is the American, American the hotel. American Hotel. And Garth and Doug, it was one of those moments where the game grabbed you. It just said to them, you, you are the guys to bring me back to life and they brought back to life this American hotel. And it is stunning, by the way, you must get there. Sharon Springs, the American hotel. Amazing martinis. <laughs> Amazing gay martinis, right? <laughs> so fast forward, I don't know the exact timing, I'm sure it's in your story, just want to layer it in. These guys are driving through the Beekman boys and... And Doug and Garth pulled us in. So I'm going to have you pick up the story yeah. from right from there. Does that blend into your yeah, world? That okay, does. Perfect. Pretty, pretty close. Um, perfect. Well, as you know, we are the Beekman boys. And I'm just curious. I want to know how many people saw our television show, The Fabulous Beekman Boys? Anybody? Okay. And then how many people may have caught us on The Amazing Race? You got some of you? Okay. You were cheering for us, obviously, right? Not the Chippendale dancers. And... <laughs> <laughs> and then how many people have no idea who we are at all? Oh my god, that is so great. So this whole That is so great. Is you. We can make it all up. <laughs> no one call us out on any lies. Uh, yeah, no. If you know. um, no, that's great. We just wanted to know that so we can tell how much of our story to tell, our backstory. Everybody who does know us, just check your messages oh, or something. <laughs> um, so anyway, we are the Beekman Boys, and we have a company called Beekman 1802, and we'll describe how that started as we go along. Let me stand on this side. Why? <laughs> Is there a trap door? Oh. <laughs> um, oops, try that. There we go. So today we're gonna do the 10 things we learned about life from our goats. These are the 10 lessons we learned about life. And we're gonna do that, but first we'll give you a little background about who we are and how we, how we got here. Um, anyway, this is Brent. Brent was a physician at Mount Sinai Hospital in in New York City, and he. This was my favorite patient. She ever. was she was wonderful. He was a geriatrician, and this woman had such a crush on him. Can't you tell? Look look at her. Can't you see? She had a crush. Every, every month when I would go see her, she lived in a nursing home. So when I would go see her every month, her kind of physical therapy was dancing. And so we would kind of stand there with one another. She couldn't really move too much, so we'd kind of sway back and forth like this. And then here's Brent with another one of his little old lady patients. Um, there we are. Oh, no, wait, that's, that's Martha. Anybody who knows us, I have a thing with Martha. Um, anyway, he was such a great physician that Martha Stewart hired him away from the hospital to her health and wellness division of her company. So he was director of that for several years. And I, I keep doing the wrong side. There we go. There we go. I um, w is, worked in advertising for many years. This is Josh's serious advertising person pose. That's what we do in advertising. We, and we I always felt, because we, we've been together now for 16 years, and so when we first met, I was you know, in my medical residency and you know, working 36 hours, and I always felt this is what advertising people did. <laughs> they just stood on a rooftop in New York looking out everything. Honestly, that is what we do. And then we bill for the hours. Right. It's amazing. <laughs> um, I was also a writer. I wrote um, several books. And in addition to that, I was also a drag queen for many years in New York. <laughs> and uh, that was before my time. That we, was before my time. we always debate whether this slide goes in or not. We, you know, depending on the audience, we're like, hey, this because one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we speak all across America, particularly when we're in the heartland. We always like to, we always still include it. Yeah. Um, but we always like to say, even if your kids make silly mistakes in their life, they can still turn out to be goat farmers. <laughs> and, <laughs> They love it. They love it. Um, all right. So anyway, we were. Oh, 
We were those typical obnoxious Manhattanites. Um, how many people are from, any, from New York City? Okay, or around You're New York City? Manhattanites too. <laughs> Probably that one he, for sure. He is. I can tell. <laughs> um, so we were the obnoxious Manhattanites. Every fall, we would we would put on our very best Ralph Lauren plaids and we would rent an expensive do you have car. Have plaid? I do. We would rent an expensive car and we would drive to upstate New York and we would we would pick apples and then we would go pick pumpkins, which we later learned they would people would just put pumpkins out in random fields. And the farmers would, and we would think we were picking pumpkins, but they were just. They still do they that. Do, and people they just never, ship them in. People never question, why are there no vines on the yeah. pumpkins? <laughs> just pumpkins. <laughs> so, and one year when we were being obnoxious Manhattan, Manhattanites upstate, we stumbled across this little town called Sharon Springs. And, and in the right, that's the American hotel that Rick was just talking about. And that is really the only building um, that, had lights on. that had lights on at the time. We drove up. It used to be a spa town. There were 90,000 people that came every summer. Uh, now the population is 547. And uh, when we drove, we were literally lost. We drove in, saw all these big old abandoned hotels falling down, no lights on. I, it looked like a cross between Petticoat Junction and The Shining. <laughs> That's what this town is like. And then we came around the corner and we saw the American Hotel with the lights on. And we, we stopped and we had dinner. We were like, oh, this is a good dinner. And then we had the martinis, which is actually their business plan. Because once you're in there having dinner and you have the martinis, then you have to stay. <laughs> Overnight, so we stayed overnight in the rooms. <laughs> That's how they do it. That's how they got us in. And we stayed overnight, and on the way out of town the next day, we um, stumbled across this, and we, we fell in love with it. We thought it was it just gorgeous. So perfect, sitting on the hill. And as we drove on by it, we saw the for sale sign in the yard, and um, we're like, you know, driving back to the city, and we're like, we have to have that place because we were obnoxious Manhattanites. When you see something you like, you have to buy it. Right? <laughs> That's how it works. Um, so we did. We cashed in everything we had. Um, we remember, this was 2006 when we first saw it. So if yes. you guys can all remember, remember what that? 2006 was like. So a little context. This is the history of home prices from 1890 to present day. And we purchased the farm right about there. <laughs> So we, 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 were, we were playing a bigger underwater. game at that point. Yeah, immediately <laughs> underwater. And you know, again, this was 2006. So if you can recall back at that point, you know, it was go-go days. Everybody's career was hot, 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 and they were giving out, you know, zero percent mortgages, so free money on the street corner. And we literally cashed in everything that we'd ever saved at that point because we were obnoxious Manhattanites. You know, the career, the future was bright. Cashed in everything, took out literally a million-dollar mortgage to buy an empty farm like that. And it was, and this is how obnoxious we were. This was just going to be a weekend place. You know? <laughs> we, we were going to come up on the weekends and do a little gardening and, you know, uh, play farmer. So anyway, 166 days. <laughs> 166 days. Does anyone remember this day? After we bought the farm, do you remember that? Yeah, OK. So that was, we're, that was when we stopped being obnoxious, obnoxious Manhattanites, um, because within 30 days of each other, um, that September, we both lost our jobs. Um, That's when the game got real, as Rick would say. Brent got a That's beautiful pink slip from Martha. It was, it was calligraphy. It was gorgeous. <laughs> um, Great stationery. Please clean out your office. <laughs> Peony um, pink. It was yeah, Peony, Peony pink. pink. Yeah. Um, and so we went from having these two amazing careers to no money at all, uh, big mortgage in the city. We had a huge mortgage in the country, um, and this is we, we describe ourselves. We were not rock bottom in 2008. We were below, we were below rock bottom. Yeah, we are under the rock bottom. So um, we should actually put a little picture of us. I know, right underneath the squash. So this really, we're going to the ten lessons we learned. We're going to tell you this is how we got from that place to now. Um, we've been called the fastest growing lifestyle brand in America um, by Nasdaq, which is great, and we have our products all around the country and in different stores. And so this is the story of how we got here, and we really owe it all to that guy. Does anybody know who this is? John. Farmer John. <laughs> yes, Farmer John. And, and this is actually a good bit, kind of big game thing, too. That he did. Even when we were obnoxious, Manhattanites, we um, would come up on the weekends. And one Saturday, we drove up before we lost our jobs. 
and there was a handwritten note in our mailbox from this guy, uh, John Hall, and he said, I, am a uh, 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 I grew up in this area on a dairy farm, and I now have a herd of 80 goats, and I'm losing my farm. Could I please bring them to your property to graze? And then he ended it, and I'm gay. You know, as if that would be <laughs> the clincher. And, and, um, so, so we met with him, and you know, if anyone saw the Fabulous Beatman Boys show, you'll know how much Farmer John loves these goats. So there was no way that we could turn him down. And so he came, and again, at that point, we had not learned our life lessons from the goats, so we were still the obnoxious Manhattanites. So in our head, we were like, this is amazing. We have a petting zoo. And, and we didn't have to do any of the work for it. We just come up on the weekends and pet, you know, pet the goat. So after we, after we lost our jobs that, that fateful autumn, um, we wound up spending a lot of time in the barn. And let me just explain this. Why? It's, it's, yes. a, it's a 200 year old house, uh, hence the name of our company, Beekman 1802, because that's when the house was built. So it's very drafty, it's not really insulated. And so um, that autumn and winter when we lost our jobs, we could not afford to heat the house. So the entire winter, it was about 48 degrees constantly in the house. And it actually was warmer to stay out in the barn with the goats. And so we spent an inordinate amount of time in the barn. We were the men who stared at goats. Like that was, <laughs> that's what we did. So and you know, over time, after we kind of got out of our depression from losing our big city jobs, uh, we actually learned a lot from staring at the goats. And so this is the 10 lessons that we've learned from them. The very first lesson we learned from our goats, if everyone else is sitting around doing nothing, stand around doing nothing. <laughs> and if any of you have ever watched goats at all, you'll know that they are all, they're a king of the mountain, right? So they're always trying to be the one climbing up higher on the rock or on the stump or whatever is around. It, literally, if, there, if I went out into our goat pasture and laid a sheet of paper down, they would fight to see who could stand on top of that sheet of paper. And the reason that that occurs is they are very playful animals, but if you think about it from a survival standpoint, any of the goats that were higher than the rest of the herd, they're gonna see danger faster, and so they're gonna get out, you know, get away faster. So they love to be on top of things, and sometimes changing your perspective can change your entire life. And so this was, so it really was a real lesson about perspective, and that's, that's actually, how we started to farm. I mean, it, now looking back, hindsight's 2020, this seems like the most simplest thing to, to conclusion to draw, but there we were, had no money, had a farm, had 80 goats. We were sending out our resumes into the dark, trying to get our old jobs back. There were no jobs at that point. And then it finally dawned on us, if we were going to save this farm, we were probably going to have to farm. <laughs> that, you know, that's how bright we were. Um, so, you know, life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. Life gives you goats, what do you make? Goat milk soap, goat milk cheese, cheese goat milk caramel, goat milk, anything, anything you make. Anything. And so, again, th that was a lesson in us in changing our perspective. We saw all of our friends and colleagues that were losing their jobs, were, trying to, they, they were forced to start again, but they weren't starting again. They were trying to reset, hit the reset button. And that's when we changed our perspective and said, you know what, the old times aren't coming back. What's our new perspective on life? So that's when we started to farm. So the second thing we learned from our goats, better the same old milking hands every day than getting used to a whole new set of calluses. So once we came to that conclusion that we actually had to run this farm, um, we were going to be very gung-ho about it. We were going to go out every morning and milk the goats. And we were going to be the best farmers ever. Goats. We were going to do it all. Uh, how many days do you think we actually milked the goats? Two, Two days. Yes. Who said it? Good job, because we've had people guess zero days before and one day before, but, but the truth of the matter is we went out that first day and you can imagine it was pretty much chaos because you know the goats were used to Farmer John's hands, right? And so they did not want our hands on them. And, but we soldiered through, we made it through the first day. The second morning went out, four o'clock in the morning. The goats wouldn't even like come out from the pasture. Yeah. They're like, oh no, we see, we, we know what's gonna happen. And, um, and, and that's when we realized that we already had the best farmer there. That, we were not put at that farm to be farmers. Farmer John was the best farmer in the county. That wasn't our role. We had, we had to realize where did we fit into this farm? What could we contribute? And we, that's when we went back and drew on our career. And, and we said, you know what? At the, at the end of the day, we were both marketers, working for Martha Stewart, working in advertising. We knew how to market. Um, and we, it, again, this back in 2008, uh, first year or two years of Facebook, 
and we, we decided we were going to put our farm on Facebook. Everybody said, that is the stupidest thing ever. Facebook is for vacation photos in, in high school reunions. There's no reason to have a farm on Facebook. We said, we're going to do it. Um, that's the only way we're going to grow an audience big enough to support this farm. So we went on Facebook. And now today, it's the number one driver of our business. Even though we're in Target, we're in all these different stores, Facebook is still, if we put, a post on, put the right post on Facebook, we do more business that day than anywhere else. Um, and in addition to that, we start, when we started selling the soap, which we apprenticed with a neighbor to learn how to make, soap maker Deb. Um, we knew it was going to take a, a lot of everybody, soap can you tell the, dollar mortgage. Can you tell the trend is Farmer John, soap maker Deb? It's, everybody has their job and their name. But you have to sell a lot of soap to pay off a million dollar mortgage. So De when Deb said, oh, have you met the weaver down the road, Karen? Uh, weaver Karen. Yeah. And, um, and so we said, no. And so she said, well, go meet her. And so we went to meet her. And she literally has two antique looms in her living room. And she'll sit there all day weaving. And so we sat with her one day and kind of learned the, you know, how to weave. And then we said, well, if we kind of come up with a design, will you weave it? And we'll sell it on our website along with the soap. And she said, of course. And so she became our first artisan. And then Karen said, well, have you met the blacksmith who lives on the other side of the village? We're like, no. And she said, well, go meet him. And so we went to Michael, and uh, blacksmith Michael, and, um, and worked with him for a couple of days and then started designing some products with him. And then he said, well, have you met Woodstern or, Wood, Woodstern or Carl? And, and so it just kept growing and growing. It's like and a kid's book, right? And now, and now um, we work with over 52 different artisans in our community. Um, because our idea from that point forward was if our business can grow, it's only going to grow if everybody else in our community grows along with it. Um, and that's, and again, that's when we, we remembered our role there in that community. We had Farmer John, we had Blacksmith Michael, we had Soapmaker Deb. They were the best at what they were doing. Our role was marketer Josh and Brand. And so we were able to take, create this brand, Beekman 1802, and take all these amazing things that were and sell them and actually bring money back into this community that needed it so badly. All right, the third thing we learned from our goats, getting mud between your toes is not as poetic as people make it out to be. <laughs> so the goats, oddly, if it is uh, raining or snowing or it has rained or snowed, if it's muddy at all out in the pasture, they will not leave the barn because they do not like to get their feet dirty. And, uh, you know, of course we thought that was odd at first, but then we're like, well, you know what, that's actually pretty smart. You know, goats have incredibly soft hooves, and so they are prone to getting rot in their hooves, so they don't want to get their feet wet. And um, so, so this to us was a lesson in practicality, and, um, oops, I went a little too fast. <laughs> Now you really want to know where that's going now. Uh, a lesson in practicality. A lot of people, we, we've been in business for a long time now. We, we speak to different entrepreneurial groups, and people say, oh my gosh, I just want to do what you, what you did. I quit my job in the city and go move to a farm and make jelly and go off the grid and live happily ever after. And we say, that, you weren't paying attention. <laughs> like, that is not how it happened. Um, and if you watch our show or read our books, you know that even though we were doing well with the soap, even though we were helping our community and building a brand, it still was not enough to pay off that million dollar mortgage. So I did keep sending out resumes. We both did. I got the short straw and got the first job back in the city. And for five years, went back and forth between the city and the farm commuting. Uh, I went from what was a super fancy high-flying job before the recession to a job of marketing where I had such amazing brands like AARP, Stouffer's Mac and Cheese, and Depend Undergarments. <laughs> So to us, it was a lesson in practicality that you know, life isn't, we, we put these romantic filters on things. And we think that, everybody thinks the Beekman boys, oh, they, they just overnight became these great farmers on a TV show and this and that. Um, but at the end of the day, you always have to be practical. When making a bold move, when making a step, always have some sort of backup plan to help you along. It doesn't make the step any less bold. It just makes you more sure when you're taking the step. Yeah, and I think that you know we we talk to a lot of entrepreneurial groups, and you know we think it's amazing to be ambitious and it's amazing to be dreamers, but ultimately what we what we like to say is that desperation is the best motivation, mm -hmm. and for us the desperation was we're going to lose this place, yeah. and so we had to kind of pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and make it happen. And so maybe your desperation is not you know you're going to lose your house. But you have to look inside you and see what you are desperate for, what you are hungry for, as Rick would say. Um, and, and that's what we had to do. All right, the fourth lesson we learned from our goats, the manure might pile up in the winter, but it keeps the barn warm. 
Sometimes life is just one crappy trade-off after another. And this is one of my favorite lessons because as I said, that first winter we were out in the barn a lot and you're thinking, well, why was the barn warmer than the house? Well, I will tell you because um, you've seen these big old barns, they have the haylofts, right? So um, that's the first thing you do to insulate the barn. You know, in the summer you put all the hay up in the hayloft and that insulates the top, keeps the heat in. But then what you do is um, at the beginning of winter, you put down a fresh bed of straw and then the goats are all bred, they're pregnant during the winter, so they're all staying inside the barn anyway, and there's six feet of snow on the ground. Um, so they poop into the hay, and then you put down fresh hay, because you can't muck out the barn because there's six feet of snow. And then they poop some more, and then you put more hay, and then more poop, and more hay. And so by this point, in the early spring, before we muck the barn for the first time, you walk into the barn, and the goats are actually staring down at you, because they're on all these layers of poop and hay. But what does poop and hay make? Heat, exactly. It's a steaming pile of crap. And, <laughs> and it actually steams, and that's what keeps the barn and all the animals so toasty, because you can't, you can't heat a barn all winter. And that was, that was our lesson in turning negatives into positives. Um, obviously, those first few years after we lost our jobs, we had a lot of negatives. We had a lot of crap thrown at us in life. And um, we learned how to turn negatives into positives. And one of the very first lessons we learned in that was when we started making our soap, we got, literally just months after we started making it, we got an order from a store called Anthropology, which is a big national chain. And they called up and they said, we want to pay, uh, or we want to order 43,000 bars of soap. And we uh, and were like, oh my god, this is great. Mortgage is going to be paid off. This is wonderful. Um, and then they said, we want to pay 23 cents a piece for it. And the, the soap at that point was costing a dollar bar. Our cost was a dollar bar. And they, 23 cents, that was the, they're as high as they would go. And so we went and said, Deb, we've got to figure this out. Soap maker Deb. Soap maker Deb. Yeah. We said, how can we make this work? How can we get the price of this soap low enough that we can create this volume? And she said, it, it just can't be done. And we said, why, why? And she said, well, when you make all natural soap, there's a fine layer of ash that forms on the top of it. It's, it's all natural soap that's what happens. She says, I have to go through and cut all that off by hand. She said, the labor cost is what drives the price up through the roof. And we said, hmm. So Deb, that only happens on all natural soap, not with any, like if you make soap with chemicals, then you don't have to shave it off, it's fine, it's per perfectly pristine. And so that's why today, even today, if you buy our, a bar of our soap, there's a little card inside that says, you know this is real 100% natural goat milk soap because there's a fine layer of ash on the top of it. <laughs> and uh, we learned how do you take that negative, turn it into a positive, and, and now people expect it. They'll look at our soap and if there's not ash on it, they'll send it back. Um, so our lesson, Turning negatives into positives. The fifth thing we learned from our don't butt heads with anyone who has bigger horns than you do. And you, you, you know, if you've seen goats or rams or anything with horns, they're always doing this, right? And um, you know, what we learned is that, maybe you want to show the next slide. The big horns. Oh, that's Martha again. Is, is that you really do want to identify who the goats with big horns are in your life? <laughs> Um, for a couple of reasons. One, we know when we were just starting out our company, um, you know, the last thing I wanted to do was go back to Martha with my hat in my hand. You know, who in here has been laid off before? Yeah, and you know what it feels like. You don't want to go back to your old boss, even if it wasn't a personal decision, a financial decision. You don't want to go back to them and say, I need your help. Um, but Josh, you know, we were trying to make a list of here are all of the assets that we have and obviously knowing Martha Stewart was one of those assets and so he's like, you have got to go and ask her for a favor. And so I said, okay, I'll do it. So I went back to Martha and I said, Martha, we're making this soap using the milk from our farm. Could we please come on the show? She had a show at that point and make the soap. And you know, Martha being very gracious said, of course you can. So uh, you know, we went back and made the soap on our show, and that's really the, the very day that mm -hmm. we that launched we launched the business. We we taught ourselves how to code the website so we could get the soap up. We only had one product at that time: the two-bar bag of soap. Um, but the, the the lesson really was a lot of uh, journalists and things were coming at us at that point and saying, "You guys are the anti-Marthas. You guys are friendly, warm, approachable. You've got your website out there. You know, people like you." And Martha at that point was the the felon trying to make a comeback. And they were always trying to bait us. And they were always saying, you know, don't you, Martha fired you. Don't you hate her? Don't you think you're the next Martha? And, and, and uh, you know, they were always trying to get us. And we said, you know what? Martha's got, still got bigger horns than we do. And by the way, we like Martha. And so that was when we said, you know what? She's got bigger horns. We like her. She can help us. We're going to work together. I've got to tell my funny and Martha. And she been, she's been supportive ever since. I've got to tell my funny Martha story. Okay. Um, uh, when our first cookbook came out, 
um, Epicurious was doing a list of who they were calling the next Martha Stewart's. And uh, we were on that list and we didn't want Martha to see it and think, oh, we're trying to capitalize on her or anything like that. So very quickly, as soon as I saw it, I you know, copied the link and sent her an email and I said, oh, look, Martha, it takes two men to equal one of you. And, <laughs> and her one word response was yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I say this to all entrepreneurs is you do have to identify that goat with the bigger horns because either one, they can be very helpful to you and by and large 99.9% .9 of the people in the world want to help other people and always remember that. But for that 0.01% who don't, if they have the big horns, they can do a lot of damage too. So it always behooves you to know who the goat is with the biggest horn. All right, the sixth lesson we've learned from our goats, if you're not sure about something, go ahead and taste it. You can always spit it out. <laughs> now, who, who here has heard the rumor that goats eat anything? Yeah, it's not true. They're we very picky eaters. Too. But th that's, you know, they will taste everything, uh, but they spit it out. And the reason they do that is because that's the way they investigate the world. You know, we can pick something up and touch it uh, and kind of investigate it that way. Well, they can't do that. So they put something in their mouth and investigate it, and then if it's not something that they like, they spit it out. The way we applied that to our life was actually our first reality show. Soon after we started getting attention, we started getting press, um, we got a call from Discovery Networks, uh, from the president of one of those networks, and she said, you guys, I think, you know, I think you've, this is great. I think you guys should do a reality show. You know, come on in and meet us. And our first reaction was no. We don't, we don't want to do that because we had a great business going. It was a high-end business. We were featured in Vogue and Vanity Fair. We were selling in, in uh, Takashi Maya and Henry Bendel. We're like, we watch reality television. We know what, what it's like. We're and like, this was the time when Honey <coughs> Boo Boo was starting, Swamp People, you know, Doug <laughs> Dynasty. So kind of that uh, hick exploitation type genre. And we didn't want people, because we, we didn't want people to make fun of the people in our community. Um, so, because we had to rely so heavily on every, Doug and Garth and the other farmers to teach us you know, how to farm and how to live in this rural environment. We did not want anybody to look bad. And so we went back to the, the head of the network and we said, you know, we'll, we'll, we didn't want to pass this up. Like we said, taste, you got to taste everything. And then if you don't like it, spit it out. We said, this is too big of an opportunity to pass up. We said, we will do it. Um, and you can make as much fun of us as you want. Because I mean, two gay goat farmers is pretty funny. You know? <laughs> yeah. As, I mean, you, three, three gay goat farmers. You can't not make fun of that. So we said, make fun of us as much as you want, but you can't make fun of our town. You can't make fun of our villagers. You can't make a honey boo boo thing out of it. And to their credit, they did not. And it was a really wonderful show. And I think that's why it became such a cult hit, was because for the first time, Main Street rural America saw themselves uh, in a positive light. They saw themselves as they actually are, embracing diversity. I mean, how many people think, because of the media, because of what you read in the media, that small towns are anti-gay or anti-everything, you know, anti they're all, it's not, it's just not true. It's not our experience. And, um, and our show really reflected that, and I think that's why it was such a hit across America. They did plenty of fun of us. Oh, that's not Doug hard. and Garth. Yeah, there's Doug and Garth. The that was you us. recognize them from that angle, really? Yeah, from that <laughs> angle. Uh, so they'd make plenty of fun of us, but they never did make fun of our town. And in fact, they made our town look great. And, um, and it's actually driven a lot of tourists to our town. We like to wear costumes in our village. <laughs> okay, so the seventh thing we learned from our goats, the grass really isn't greener on the other side of the fence. And this is a great life lesson. You know, you, we all, you know, we all- I mean, it sounds very simple, but no, there's a truth in it. Yes, because the goats will try all day, literally all day, to get over the fence or through the fence or under the fence. Uh, not so that they can go off like two miles down the road and eat something down there, literally so they can eat the grass on the other side of the fence. And by watching them, we're like, you know what? It's not just human nature, it's real animal nature to think that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. It's a, and, tr it's a truism that's actually true. And sort of the way that we applied this to our life, this thinking, is, is now that we're in social media, we're all in social media and Facebook, and we see the world around us the grass is always greener. All of your friends on Facebook have the best vacations. Their kids are graduating top of their class. They never fight with they their spouse. They never argue. Have money Everything's issues. great. And when we started the company, we said, you know, we, we don't want to be Martha. We don't want to be those kind of people that just present the perfect side of things. So our company, one of our core values is sharing. We don't teach, uh, we share. And so everything that we learned as we were learning to farm, as we were learning all these different craftspeople, we would share. And we would share the mistakes too. 
And my favorite example is really just from this last winter, we opened up the pantry door and uh, we took a picture of our pantry and we said, we gotta clean this out. <laughs> and we, we had over 1,600 replies on there of people either saying, my pantry looks just like that or, oh my God, your pantry looks terrible. I can't believe you guys you know, live my like that. My pantry's better than your pantry. Yeah. Um, but it just created this, this um, groundswell of, gosh, the grass is not greener. And people were really validated by the idea that even people they see on TV or even people they, they read in magazines, their life is not And, and the, way, the reason we different. point this out about the goats is that people are, I mean, it is part of animal DNA that you're going to think that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. So you have to constantly remind yourself when you see those images on Facebook or you hear someone telling a story that you remind yourself that their grass is the same grass that I have. Because otherwise, every single day, every Facebook post, you're going to be beating yourself up about it. All right, the eighth thing we've learned from our goats, if everyone else is running away in the same direction, join them now and ask questions later. <laughs> Does anyone happen to know who this is in the center of the slide? Pocospot. Pocospot, yep. She is our diva llama. And uh, yes, a true diva. She now has like 14,000 followers on Twitter. And, um, and does anyone know what a llama's purpose is on a goat farm? What? Don't they, keep, don't they keep away coyotes? They're goat herders. They are goat herders. And the, the, uh, the way they do it is that obviously she's much taller than any of the other goats. So she can look out over the pasture. And if she sees danger, a, a coyote or a dog or something out there that's going to threaten the herd, she will run into the barn to save herself. And this, <laughs> that's, no, honestly, that's, that's how it works. She will run into the barn to save herself, and the goats, because they're herd animals, will follow whoever is running. And so that's how the herd works. And likewise, in the mornings, she's the first one to exit the barn to start grazing, and then all the goats exit the barn to start grazing. Um, they don't do anything without following her lead. I, I'm, focus, I'm not a big fan of Pocus Ball, personally, because there can't be... There can only be one, one diva on a farm. So I always like to point out that's not actually herding, that's fleeing. No, um, it's a style of herding. But I did that a few weeks ago, and a woman in the audience was like, no, that's leading. <laughs> She's leading them. That's right. Um, so the way we applied this to our life uh, was on the Amazing Race, and when we ran that, when when we were when we were uh, picked to to be on that show, um, we we knew again since we were in reality TV, we kind of knew why they picked us. We we watched those shows. We knew why they cast us. We're like, uh, we're the middle-aged gay couple. We're supposed to, you know, throw out some funny lines and then be gone by episode four so that the All-American football player can win, right? Because that's how reality is. And literally, this guy on the left here is an All-American all in the Bucks. white shirt there. For the University of Texas. So he was the designated winner in our minds. And we, we, knew, go, we knew that going in. And I mean, we were up against the uh, snowboarding world champions, jiu-jitsu world champions, a football player, a college football player. Chippendale dancers. Lumberjacks, Chippendale dancers. You know, we... We knew it was, we were not going to power our way to winning this game. Um, but what we did was we, um, we applied the, the three lessons that we had learned in life up to that date through those hard times. And those three lessons, you'll find this all over our website. You know, we say it all the time. The three things are work hard, never quit, and help your neighbor. Those are, it's the three simplest things that we live by. And those first two things, you're like, work hard, never quit. OK, that makes sense on a race. The third one, help your neighbor. That doesn't really make sense when you're racing for a million dollars and compete, competing against 12 other teams. And, but it didn't matter, because we knew that's how we got through these dark times. Our only chance at winning was, was applying what we knew in life, and it were those three things. And anybody who watched the race or, or, or were on social media at that time, people were getting angry at us, helping the other teams the entire way through. If you don't know how the race goes, there's different legs of each race, and whoever comes in, whichever team comes in last at the end of that leg is eliminated. So people could not understand, why are we helping people? Why are we pointing out where the clues are? Why are we, we've stopped and finished puzzles with people. We, we undid the locks on the bridge for somebody. We waited for someone because we liked them and they weren't feeling well, so we, you know, we waited till they were ready. And for whatever reason, it worked. We weren't eliminated, we were U-turned, we had luck. Uh, we continued going until uh, there were only three of us left in the race, and it was us the All-American football player and his cheerleader girlfriend, and the two Chippendale dancers. And it's not that hard to outwit a Chippendale dancer. <laughs> so at the very end, that's what happened. It was a, it was a memory puzzle, and we, and we were able to pull ahead. But for all everyone who said, why are you helping your neighbor, 
again, we don't know why, it's just what we do, and we think it works in life. Um, all right, the ninth thing we learned. There's no better pillow than someone else's tummy. Yeah, and this really kind of encapsulates our entire village of Sharon Springs. When the goats uh, come in from grazing in the afternoon, they'll all kind of stand around in the barn like, what, what should we do now? We've eaten all day, what should we do? And so they'll kind of stand there and then ultimately one of them will decide, okay, I'm just gonna lay down. Because the floor in the barn is not the most comfortable place. You know, it's concrete, it's cold, it's, you know, that's just a barn. And so one of them will lay down and then the next one will decide to lay down and they'll lay their head on that one's stomach. And then the next one will lay down and lay their head on the other one's stomach. And so before you know it, you've kind of got like this kind of chain, amorphous pile of goats laying there. And but the way, the way we say, you know, there's always gotta be that first goat down. And that's, you know, the, there's, they, they're one of the ones that take that trip down to the hard floor. And the way we applied that in our life is in Sharon Springs, the first year, uh, first fall we were there, we said, you know, we want to draw tourism, we want to have a harvest festival. And so we went to the, the village elders, which was everyone but us. Pretty much. And, um, <laughs> and we said, you know, we want to have a harvest festival. And they said, Ugh, no, 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 that, we tried that, doesn't work, you know, you city people, it's just, we already did that. Well, we're like, when did you do that? Yeah, what, what, when, what went wrong? And they said, well, it was 1963, the president was shot, it was like, I just, and, you know, and we're like, oh, all right, all right, we get it. We, you know what? We'll do the harvest festival. We'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. We want to have it. We're going to throw it. So, so that, we did, us and a few friends, we, so we put it on. Year, uh, if you haven't been to Sharon Springs or know that area, it literally is a one stoplight town. Like our main street is half a mile long. And uh, there, it's uh, like Main Street is here and then US Route 20 is here. So I made Josh dress up as William Beekman, the founder of our farm. He had on leotards and like a hat, you know, tri corner hat and make him stand up at the stoplight ringing a bell, you know, waving people down to the village and the transfer trucks shooting by, like beeping their horn at him. You can take the boy out of drag, but right. you can't take drag out of drag. Um, that first, first year was successful. We had about 500 people stop in, in a town. We 547 people in the village. And so and we're like, we thought, this is this amazing. This is going pretty well. 500 people. And they were filming it for the TV show. The TV show wasn't airing yet, but they were filming it for the first season. So it aired that following year and the rest of the world saw this little town come together and pull, put on this great little festival. Now, so it aired, people all saw this. By the second year, over 5,000 people came to a harvest festival. They swamped the town, and I love showing this picture because yeah, this guy on the right, his this name here, is Joe Todd. And he's a village elder in charge of traffic. <laughs> so we, we, we love that. But anyway, 5,000 people, you're, everyone's like, oh, this is great, this is amazing. But by Saturday at noon, we were out of food. For a two-day festival. Two-day festival. We only had one and a half restaurants in town at that point. And only two porta potties And we had people from all over the world, from Norway, from Australia, from everywhere our show aired, all 50 states, they had come. We were out of food. It was a disaster. And in the afternoon, around 1 or 2 in the afternoon, I saw people walking around with hot dogs and hamburgers. And I asked one of them, where did you get that? And they said, up on the hill. Well, it turns out one of the villagers, one of the village elders who told us no in the first place, he had driven 40 miles to the nearest grocery store in Canajoharie. He bought all the hot dogs, all the hamburgers, all the buns, all the coleslaw, all the potato chips, all the anything you could eat at a picnic. And came gave home, it away. Came home, set up a grill, and he gave it away to people. Gave it away. And we asked him afterwards, why did you do that? And he said, you guys worked so hard to get people to town. I wanted to make sure this year I kept them here and they wouldn't go home hungry. And then every year since then, we just had, uh, uh, well, you were now planning for our ninth annual mm -hmm. Harvest Festival, and every year it kept growing and growing. More and more people from the community pitch in. The high school kids help empty the porta potties. You know, now we have 15. And uh, this past year, we had 15,000 people at the Harvest Festival. It's amazing. But again, to. So to illustrate the idea, it's, it's the first goat down. That villager who went and bought the thing, he said, you know what, you guys were the first goat down last year. You put your, you put, laid down on the cold, hard floor of this village, and, and this year I'm, I'm the next goat down. And so we always say to people, a lot of us live in, are in work environments that are kind of toxic or not very happy, and everyone says, oh, if only this would change or this would change. Or, or we, we live, live in small, small towns where nothing's happening. Where nothing happens. Like, everyone's saying, why isn't this happening for us? Or why and is somebody when we're doing, And when we're talking to entrepreneurial groups, and they're saying, my business isn't this, or if this would change or this would change, and we always say, you know what, sometimes you just got to be that first goat down. And, uh, and so that's, 
That's one of the lessons. One of the last lessons. And so, if you find yourself in those situations where nothing is being accomplished and you're just saying, "Well, why aren't you doing this?" or "Why aren't you doing this?" Sometimes you have to be that first goat down, and that's what a lot of people don't have the strength and mindset and fortitude to do is to be that first goat to lay down. So the tenth thing we learned from our goats: fences are merely suggestions. And anybody who knows goats knows that they will go through anything. You could put up a cinder block wall with barbed wire on the top, and they will just find a way under it, over it, they'll get it done. And this leads us to our last um, project. We've had a lot of success in our town. We've had a lot of success with our business. Um, this last <laughs> fence, I know you're like, what does this mean? Um, this, this is a project of us. This is our last fence. Let me get a little background on this. No, wait, wait I want to say why. This okay. is our last All fence. Right. So a lot of people have said to us, like, this, this is great. You guys are very successful. It's wonderful. You guys have been so lucky. They say you've been terribly lucky. You've, you've got picked to be on The Amazing Race. You got picked to have a television show. Your business, Martha got you on the, her show. They say you're so lucky. Other farmers, it, you know, it's great that you've done that, but other small farmers will never make a living at small farming. You guys are just lucky. And so our challenge is how are we going to help other small farmers become middle class in America again? And this is how we're doing it. This is called Project Mortgage Lifter. And it started um, very, in a, in a very selfish way. Yes. We, um, so for those of you who don't know all of our story, as we were trying to get the farm up and running and trying to get the business up and running and pay down this million dollar mortgage. When I was going back and forth from the city to the farm every weekend, that was the, that was the plot of the television show was how are we going to get Josh to the farm full time? Because, you know, we had, at that point, we had been together for 12, going on 13 years. And so, you know, when we're starting the business, we're like, well, we can live apart for one year. You know, it's our year of sacrifice. And uh, well, that turned into five years of sacrifice because, uh, you know, as a business starts growing, it's so much more expensive than you ever, you know, planned out or budgeted for. And so we were living apart for five years trying to get everything, you know, trying to really get out from under the mortgage. And so this one year we decided, we came across this heirloom variety of tomato called the Mortgage Lifter Tomato. And uh, if any of the, or your gardeners, you'll know about this tomato. But it was first grown out in 1929 by a West Virginia farmer. And it was so successful for him that he paid off the mortgage on his farm. So he called it the mortgage lifter tomato. So at that point, we're like, oh, well, let's plant out an acre of these tomatoes. We're going to start bottling our tomato sauce, and we're going to call it the mortgage lifter. And we're going, that was going to be how we sold it. We were going to go to the farmer's market and hold up the jar and say, buy a jar, help us pay off our mortgage. Like, that was going to be it. So we planted the tomatoes in April. Hold on. What? <laughs> I'm in the midst of Well, hurry up. We've got to get to the, the okay. point. OK. So, when, you guys love that story. So the, uh, we, when our first cookbook came out, we were out at the Santa Monica Library, and we were doing a book signing, and this little lady came up, she was like 80 years old, she had her oxygen tank with her, you know, very unassuming, had waited till the end of the line, because you know, she didn't want to disturb anybody, and, um, you know, we're signing her book, and she's like, oh, you know, I love the Fabulous Beatman Boys show. Every week, my next door neighbor comes over, and we watch the show together. And so, in my head, I was like, oh, so nice. These two little ladies watching our show together. It's like their bonding time. And, uh, and then she said, and she's the president of CBS Reality TV. <laughs> and I didn't believe her, because why would the president of CBS Reality TV come to this woman's house to watch our show? And so really, uh, kind of flippantly, I said, well, if she's such a big fan, why aren't we on The Amazing Race? And she said, I'm going to tell her. And <laughs> I didn't believe her, because, again, why? why we thought why? she was crazy, because a lot of crazy people do come see us. Yeah, one of you, is, <laughs> one of you are crazy, I'm sure. <laughs> Maybe it's real. Just the one? But, and so, but, so we went on home, didn't believe, you know, didn't think a thing of it. And then two days later, the phone rang, and they said, hi, we're calling from The Amazing Race. We heard you wanted to run. And so that was the year the that we planted this, the tomatoes. Yeah, the context of this story is, is that we had planted the tomatoes in the spring. We ran the race in May and June. So when we came home in June, in time to start the tomato harvest, we knew that we had won the million dollars and paid off our mortgage. And so that's how we said, OK, let's give back to all those other small farms who are never going to have the opportunity to win, you know, run the amazing race. And so now we give back 25% of the profits of the mortgage lifter to help other small farms pay down their mortgages. So. So this, so, so this is really the reason that we, um, this, this is a lot of the reason we go around and talk, because we, we, need, we need your guys' help to, do, to accomplish this. But the first year was successful. We gave away over $15,000 to small farms. That was great. By the end of the first year, um, we got a call 
a store called Target. And they said, uh, you know, we'd love to carry your sauce. We love the story that we're going to test it out in 250 stores. They put it in those 250 last November. It flew off the shelves. Um, and then they put it in all 1,500 stores in February. It continued to fly off the, the shelves. And then just uh, two months ago, they said, we want you to develop 46 new products <laughs> for Mortgage Lifter. So our goal now is, so I, one thing I want to say about the project is not only do we give money back to small farms, but we source as many of the ingredients as we can from small farms to go into it. So we, it's a virtuous circle. And, we, and we, that sounds... We call that the farm to shelf revolution because there's no way for small farms, and if you think about a small farm, their average annual revenue on a small family farm is about twenty-five dollars to $28,000. So these farm families work you know, all year, you know, planting and then harvesting, and then they go sit at a farmer's market on Saturday, you know, and try to sell their stuff, which then goes immediately bad, you know, if they don't sell it. So their revenue, not profit, revenue is $28,000 a year. And the, w the only way that that's ever going to change is if we can start integrating the small farm back into the national food supply chain. And, you know, chefs have been great, you know, about farm to table. You know, I'm sure lots of you are great about going to your farmer's market. And that's all fabulous, but it's not going to really move the needle. So, uh, it, and so, like I said, we're trying to source the ingredients from small farms for these 42 new products. It's not as easy as you think. Uh, we, we are going to manufacturers all around the country that are making salad dressings, baking mixes, all these things you know, that you buy in your grocery store. They're buying all, they're just ch checking off an order list for their ingredients from China or South America. And what we're doing is we're introducing them to farmers who live within a 100 mile radius of their factories. Um, and you think, well, that just makes sense. But it, there are so many hurdles to get that done. And uh, we've, we literally have been turning to Facebook to find farmers near these manufacturing centers. Uh, in, in doing it, but we, we are, we're almost there. We've almost got it done. We're 98% confident we're going to be able to launch it in November. Um, and again, this is why, this is why, really why we come to, to different people, because we need your help. We put all of our time and energy, we're still a small company, into getting this program going. At the end of the day, we don't have money like a Nestle or a Stouffer's or, a, you know, all these people. We, we won't be running television ads. You know, we won't be running magazine ads. So this is entirely a word of mouth project. So in Target today, if you go today, you'll find our pasta sauces uh, on the shelf. So if you see those and you could pick them up or even just pick them up and sh or talk about them with somebody else in the store, that's great. And then in November, when you see the section, the Beekman section, we'd love for you guys to help us spread that word too so people are aware of it because we don't have the money to market it any other way. And if you go to Target and you're standing there in front of the, and you find the sauce and you're standing there, we have coined a term called the shelfie. So it's like a selfie, <laughs> except you take it in front of the shelf. So you take your picture standing there and you put it on our Facebook page. And Target, of course, is monitoring our Facebook page. So they love to see all of these shelfies popping up of people in the Target store. So go in there. If you find the sauce, take your shelfie, put it on our Facebook page, and we'll be eternally grateful. So Brent, I think we took up a lot more time than we were supposed to take up. But let's see. Did we? Not too bad. A little bit fast. Um, yeah, oh my God, just it, it, it quintess, you are quintessential bigger game players in our language, right? Oh. It just, it's sort of like, oh, that, oh, oh, then over here, and then, right? <laughs> it sort of, it found you, it, it you grew you. You gotta yeah. follow the llama, right? That's yeah. what I'm gonna call, that's the next book, follow, no, that's your book. Yeah. So thank you so much for this inspiring, what I, what I love about it, Mo, I mean, we're so, it's so pragmatic, it's so, you can touch it, you can feel it, it's hope made real, right? It is hope made real. So thank you for doing this good work. Thank you. In our thank world, you. so. So, do you guys wanna do, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks, oh, so nice. Thank you. You trained him to do that. No, I did not. And, and, and cute, right? It's not the boots, boys. So are you guys staying? Can you stay? Yeah, we'd love it if there's any questions. Or... Okay, let's do a little Q&A time, and then we'll get out but shortly. If anybody, has, if anybody has to go to the bathroom, we won't feel bad if you yeah. have to leave. Are you guys staying for yeah. dinner? I don't remember. Chuck told me no. you we can't. We have to pick up our dog. Check up the dog. <laughs> are you able to do any book signing? Do you have any books here? I don't remember. I don't think the books happen. No, but actually, I thank you for bringing that please, up. Because please. if anybody would like to read more of, of our story, um, yeah. the, our memoir is The Bucolic Plague. Uh, and you can get it at... Uh,
Amazon it's, or Barnes & Noble or wherever. It's where, really where, great. I, or, I read and our it. website, Beekman1802.com. You can get our cookbooks and all of our products there. Yeah, fabulous cookbooks. Are they available for, for pictures that we can post? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. No, they're going to not do pictures. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. It's like, right. <laughs> So, of course, uh, what, I, what I wanted to say, oh, the other thing you guys do, which I, I to, was telling them backstage over here. So, during the holidays, it's during the holidays, right? Oh, yeah. Come, come closer. I just, I I'm a little codependent. I'm, glad we're I'm, a, the microphone I'm a little codependent. Oh, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> um, over the holidays, I don't know which holiday, Christmas, Christmas, Christmas yeah. but yeah. like it's a couple days before, they do this 24 hour marathon. Yeah, YouTube marathon. And the way that well, started. That's right was that we, um, the, the two years ago, you know, on our last shipping day for holidays, because, you know, we ship out, that's when we ship out a lot of soap and cheese and things for holiday gifts. And so we were going to have to be at the shop, like, packing orders and stuff. We knew we were going to be there all night. And, so, and, and I want to say, going back to that lesson of sharing, we tell you we share everything. So our customers, who we call neighbors, they're all our neighbors, um, they, we share what's going on in the mercantile. We share, they, they know our employees as well as we do, Team Beekman. Um, so everybody gets to know each other on Facebook all around the world, all around the country. So they knew what a big day the, the last day of shipping is for us, which is you know, usually the 19th, 18th or 19th of December. And it's a 24-hour, all night, you know, all hands on deck. The town comes in, helps us wrap soap and ship. So there was so much excitement from our customers and the, our neighbors around the world. We said, you know what, we're just going to put a camera on there so that they can, they can call in, they can ask questions, they can see what's going on. And it was also a, a little customer service thing because every time we've wrapped up a box, we would hold it up to the camera and we'd say, Jane Smith, your package is going out right now. Like this. And uh, we kept it going, but what was great, so it was 24 hours, and what happened was, it was first literally just that, a camera and us saying, your package is on its way. And then, but then our neighbors started dropping by. So Doug and Garth came by with martinis, and, and then, other people, and, and Rosemary came by with pizza. You know, you know, and everybody came by to take advantage. Of, and then the kids from the high school the next day after school came down and caroled in front of the camera, and it went out. So that was the first year, and it was so organic. Um, and now we did it again this this year, and now it's a full-on show. Yeah. So I was this year. I. The day came up, and I get, I'm on their email list. You must be on their email list because the funnest things come through. It's all fun and good new products and stuff. But this email comes through. You know, this is the show's coming, and I, I put it on my calendar. I got to watch the show. You know, so I, I you can you can tap it at any moment. You know, you're like 10 minutes, and then you go off and do some work, and you know, what's happening now? You know, and you come back. And I woke up at 3 a.m. and I'm like, on, you know, go downstairs, and I'm turning at the computer. Chuck's like, what are you doing? I'm watching the Beekman Boys. <laughs> you know, and you guys were up. You're like, oh, you're like on the, t you know. Do they like, have the oh, glitter oh, on oh. yet? Yeah, yeah. The glitter okay. on. Yeah, so, yeah, it's we get fun. a little punch drunk. Yeah, yeah, it's really fun. So cool. So a couple of questions. We'll do a couple of questions, and then we'll. Uh, okay, Mike. Here we go. Mike over there. We can there. repeat if you if you want to shout. It's fun. Where's the guy, Mike? Hey there. Hi. Hi. It is. So Target left Canada. Sadly. Yes. Can we buy your, your sauce anywhere in Canada? Uh, no, not no. in Canada. But you can buy. Bummer. I know. Now on your way home, are you Bummer. driving? Are you yes. driving? Find a target on well, your here's the thing. All the way up to the border. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. No, you know what? You can also, if you shop off of our site, um, I, I shouldn't say this, but if you shop off of our site, it's obviously a higher percentage of profit than if, if you go to buy from Target. But if you can't get it at Target, buy it straight from us and more money. We will ship to Canada, but then if shipping I know, then they expensive. charge us that yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. So on your way to Tar, on your way home, stop by Target. Okay. There's probably one in Ticonderoga. That's in the mic right here. That's fine. Thank you. So if we all represent different geographies, what can we do going back to the farmers or back to our local communities to continue to tell your bigger game? No matter what your income, if you just say, okay, 10% or 5% of my grocery budget is going to be spent at the farmer's market and everybody in your community did that, that would be a, a, a huge difference. Um, so that would be the, the starting point. And then the next thing would just be to take your Target shelfie, put it on your Facebook page and tag us, and then your friends are going to be like, what's a Target shelfie? What's Mortgage Lifter? And then you get to tell that story. And I think the, the, difficult part, the difficult part of the project that we're doing um, I, I'll, I can, I'll talk about it. The difficult part about the Mortgage Lifter project is that it does, you do have to tell the story in order to understand it. It's not just a, you know, 25% off or, a, you know, non-GMO or organic like a lot of companies. You have to know the story. So that's, when we tell the story, people are like, I got to get behind this. So what we are, would ask you guys to do is help us tell that story. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors, say, hey, if you go into Target and you see this thing, here's what it's all about. There's these two weird guys who are trying to give money back to small farms. And if you help us tell that story, then we can spread it. Cool. That's, 
too. Oh, there's a lot of hands. We're going to uh, go. Whoever's got the mic. All right. Um, first, I want to, I met you guys outside, so you know that I'm from a teeny tiny town in central New York. Um, so I want to say thank you for what you're doing, because I don't know if people who aren't from rural areas with farmland understand what's happening. So thank you. Um, and my question is, is can you describe a little bit, because I've driven through Sharon Springs on my way to Norwich, New York, um, and know what it used to look like, and talk about the transformation that the community coming together has made. Yeah. And we, you know, I think uh, because of the visibility from The Amazing Race and whatnot, we often get um, too much credit for uh, uh, saving Sharon Springs. And we always try to deflect that because it honestly really does take a village. So if it was just like Doug and Garth at the hotel or just our business there, it wouldn't, you know, 15,000 people wouldn't come. It's this whole village and the community and the positivity and the cheerleading for everybody else. That's what does it. And that's what's so hard in small communities, particularly in upstate New York where small communities, rural communities have been so impoverished for so long. It's really hard to see the positivity. It's hard to see the beauty and, around you. And, and I, so oh, I think, you know, again, it just goes back to that thing of who's going to be the first goat to lay down and kind of change that mindset. Um, and and the, okay. I was going to say, a lot, we, we get from a lot of small communities saying, I also want to dissuade people of the thought that Sharon Springs is one, you know, happy, huggy, huggy group. You know, it's like any small town. We do have people who, you know, don't love everything that's happening and, and want to do things. But the, what, the way we encourage people is we say, you just need to have 51% optimists in your community. 51%. If you can just hit 51%, then the tide turns. But it's, if, you do, if you give up before you get there, then it never will change. Who's got a mic? Who's ever got it? Go for it. Who's ever got the mic? Go, Michael. Perfect. It's not working? Is it on? Yeah, it's uh, how do you now not go into overwhelm? Because this seems like an exponential growth pattern. How do you sustain who you are? How do you sustain the product and your origin to how this all came about? You know, I think, yes, I think if you look at it from an outside perspective, it seems like this is overwhelming thing or, you know, but uh, it, it really just goes back to passion. And, you know, we love what we do and we work 24 seven and we did 108 appearances last year. And in every one of those appearances, someone from the audience says, oh, what's going on in Sharon Springs? And you know, if you're in Washington State in the furthest corner you know, from Sharon Springs and someone knows where Sharon Springs is, that's what makes it worth it for us to do it. And when we get, you know, we just gave away another $18,000 to small farms and when that small farm gets their check and they're like, we're buying our first ever tractor, you know, that's what makes it worthwhile for us. So, um, you know, of course, anything you can accomplish if you're working 24 seven and if you're passionate about it, you don't care if you're working 24 seven because that's what you and, love to do. Well, I think one thing we did that we haven't really even realized we've done, though, is over the last year, we started taking Sundays to work on the farm and only on the farm, not on the business. We, we used to do our chores and things as we could get them done. But now we said Sunday is our day on the farm. And I think that's important to what you're saying. How do you stay authentic in, in what you're doing is there's a lot of companies and organizations that say they're storytellers, you know, like they're, you know, we're a brand and we're a storytelling brand, we're gonna tell you our story. What keeps us grounded is that we're, we, we're story livers. And so as long as, that, as long as we have that Sunday, and honestly, people, we get the question all the time, how much staff do you have on the farm? It's still just the two of us and Farmer John. He does, he does the ground, the, the flower gardens and the yard. I do the vegetable gardens, we grow all our own food, and John does the animals, and that's it. And I think the day that we don't do that anymore, we won't be authentic. Just, just wanna say, that's a keeper. I hope you get that storyteller versus story liver. Yeah, well, yes. Each, that's an incredible distinction. And, and I think that is, that is a difference between a lot of brands and a lot of organizations. They, they can tell a good story, but, the, but once, you, once your job is telling it and not being it, it's, it's a whole different this game. This is the juice, right? So, uh, another, yeah, one more. We're going to do one more, and then we're going to shift um, it. Hi there. I know you don't have a large marketing budget, but have you thought of doing like product demonstrations at Target where you could get your story out? Oh, we do. Oh, you do? Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, we, okay. We go and set up a table in a grocery store and we stand behind it and we sample the product and... No, oh, I'm going to tell you what we did this week. Um, so there's a, there's a, a TV channel called Evine, Evine Live, which is, it's, there's HSN, QVC, and Evine. And 
they, they asked if we would come on their, the show and, and sell our soap on the show. It's a television, you know, one of those things, like, buy now, you know, back. And we were hesitant. We're like, is that really our brand, you know, television shopping and all that? And then we looked at it and we said, well, here's a chance to tell the story, you know. What we didn't realize is that we'd be doing it for nine hours, telling the story over and over again. <laughs> But it was great. Every 50 minutes, there we were. You know, like we're two city guys from Sharon Springs, New York, who started a farm, and here's our goats. So, we 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 try to uh, we try to find ways to market while we're while we are still producing revenue. That's how we can do it. The fabulous Beekman Boys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, guys.